For a case of upper abdominal pain, using our mnemonic old cards, we note the onset, or when did it start? Did it come on suddenly, or was it more gradual? To help localize the pain, we'll ask our patient to point with one finger. For duration, we want to know is the pain constant, or is it coming and going, as we'll see below in biliary colic. If it is intermittent, we like to note the frequency. How long does an episode of pain last for, and how many episodes are you having per day or per week? And next, we can note the progression. Does the pain appear to be occurring more frequently or more severely? Or, if there's been no progression, we'll be sure to include in our patient note no progression to show that we asked. To help characterize the pain, we'd like some descriptors. For example, is it sharp or dull, among others? And, since this is an upper GI case, we can ask now or later in our review of symptoms of any GERD or dyspepsia symptomatology, such as heartburn or epigastric pain, early satiety or fullness or nausea, aggravating and alleviating factors, radiation, and again, if there are none, we'll also be sure to include no aggravating and alleviating factors and no radiation in our patient note to show that we've asked, treatments tried, and severity on a scale of 1 to 10. We'll divide our case of upper abdominal pain into epigastric pain, right upper quadrant pain, and a mix of both. For all cases, we should order a rectal exam, CBC, serum electrolytes, and an x-ray of the abdomen. In functional dyspepsia, such as a motility disorder, which interestingly makes up about 75% of dyspepsia cases, our supporting points will include an epigastric pain or dyspepsia, and it can be aggravated by meals. We'll add to our workup an H. pylori test and esophagastroduodenoscopy. In gastroesophageal reflux disease, we'll see epigastric pain or dyspepsia. Our patient can have a dry cough, and it can be aggravated by meals, lying down, or at night, and alleviated by antiacids or sitting up. Both gastritis and peptic ulcer disease are sequela of a similar disease process, and if we're thinking of one, we can generally include both. In gastritis, we'll see the epigastric pain or dyspepsia. The onset here now tends to be more acute, and it can be aggravated by meals or alleviated by antiacids. Our patient will have a history of GERD, NSAID use, recent travel, or eating out at a restaurant. In peptic ulcer disease, we can see epigastric pain or dyspepsia, and now the onset here tends to be more chronic, with perhaps prior episodes of gastritis. It can be aggravated by meals and alleviated by antiacids with a history of GERD or heavy NSAID use. In cholelithiasis or biliary colic or stones in the gallbladder, we'll have right upper quadrant pain that's colicky or coming and going. Classically, our patient will be fat, female and 40, with pain radiating to the right shoulder and aggravated by fatty food. If we have nausea and vomiting, since it is a bodily fluid, we'll be sure to use our mnemonic A, B, and C to write down for our patient note the amount, if there's any blood, and the color. For right upper quadrant cases, we'll order a bilirubin alkaline phosphatase, ASC, ALT, hepatitis serology, and an ultrasound of the abdomen. In cholecystitis, or a gallbladder infection from stones in the cystic duct, we'll see right upper quadrant pain that's now progressed to being constant. Our patient can also classically be fat female in 40 with radiating pain to the right shoulder and aggravated by fatty food. And if we see nausea and vomiting, we'll be sure to include in our patient note the A, B, and Cs. And now we can have a new onset fever. And as we'll see in our physical exam coming up, the positive special test of a Murphy sign. In cholodocolodiasis, or stones in the common bile duct, we can see right upper quadrant pain with the patient being fat female in 40 radiating to the right shoulder, and nausea and vomiting, which by now we know to include the A, B, and C, and now we can see new onset jaundice, and this can be revealed to us in the review of symptoms with a dark urine or pale stool. We see a dark urine because the conjugated bilirubin is water-soluble and can now leak out, and the pale stool because the conjugated bilirubin can't make it out of the bile ducts, and thus the gut flora can convert the urobilinogen to stercobilin. In cholangitis, or a biliary infection from stones in the common bile duct, we can see the right upper quadrant pain. Our patient can also be fat female in 40 with radiating pain to the right shoulder, nausea and vomiting, jaundice, and now a new onset fever. And in hepatitis, which includes the separate diagnosis of either alcoholic hepatitis or infectious hepatitis, we can see right upper quadrant pain with jaundice, 
nausea and vomiting, a fever, and a history of heavy alcohol use, travel, or drugs. In pancreatitis, we can have a mix of both epigastric and right upper quadrant pain. Our patient can have dyspepsia, and the pain can be alleviated by leaning forward, also radiating to the back. If we see nausea and vomiting, we'll be sure to include the amount, blood, and color of the vomitus. We can have jaundice, and now we can have foul and greasy stools from the absence of the pancreatic enzymes. We could also have a history of alcohol or gallstones in the case of gallstone pancreatitis. And we'll add to our workup an amylase, lipase, and lactate, lipid panel, and an ultrasound of the abdomen. And finally, in a GI malignancy such as gastric, pancreatic, or gallbladder cancer, we'll see a mix of either epigastric or right upper quadrant pain. Our patient can have dyspepsia. The pain can be radiating to the back with a characteristic finding for a cancer of a weight loss and decrease in appetite. Can also have a nocturnal component. Our patient can be presenting with jaundice or foul and greasy stools in the case of pancreatic cancer. And we can have a, family, a positive family history. And we'll include in our workup a CT of the abdomen. Okay, we'll start our abdominal exam with a hand sanitizer and we want to ask our SP if we have permission to examine you. Okay, we'll start with the hint exam. We'll look into his eyes if we're going to be concerned about, about jaundice in an abdominal case. So we'll make a comment that there's no scleral icterus and look down please. Okay, we'll move on to the oral pharynx. So we'll use a tongue depressor here. The key thing to do is you don't want to add too much pressure for the SP. So just very lightly you can press down and ask them to please stick out your tongue. Okay, and we'll comment that we don't see any uh, lesion while he's still sitting up to the cardio exam to get that out of the way. So the best way to do this here is again to lower the gown slightly and to ask them to please uh, sit and hold it like this. This will protect them and keep them covered up. We want to verbalize that we don't see any visible lesions in the anterior chest, no visible lesions to the posterior chest. And we'll go ahead and palpate and see if he has any chest tenderness. So please let me do the same thing on the back. Next thing we can do is auscultate for his heart sound, and so we'll use the mnemonic apartment M225A, and we'll listen first in his right intercostal for the aortic, and we'll go over to the left for the pulmonic, and then we'll go to the tricuspid. And now for uh, mitral, if this was a female, a good tip is to ask him to please lift up your left breast. We could comment that we hear an audible S1, S2, regular rate and rhythm. No audible S3s, S4s, or murmurs, rubs, and gallops. Once we completed the cardio, we could transition nicely to the home exam while he's still sitting up. And so we could go ahead and percuss. We'll start above his clavicle, comparing left to right. And I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing in the back, three spots. We could also rotate again, and we'll start above the clavicle. We're going to use the bell first. Please take it in the instructions you want to give. So please take a deep breath when you feel my stethoscope. Please take a deep breath in and out. Okay. Compare left to right. Do the same thing on the back now. Okay, and then we could verbalize again that there was, it was clear to auscultation, no audible wheezing. Once we concluded the cardio and pulmonary exam, we could cover him up again. Now we can instruct him, I'm going to now lie you down to do the abdominal exam, is that all right? Okay, so we want to help them down. And you don't want to forget to extend the legs for the uh, leg rest. Now you could rest your legs. So for the abdominal exam, they'll have a gown here, and you want to move it up all the way to their pelvic, pelvis, and then you want to ask permission to take it up. We want to do the same step again. We want to first verbalize that we see no visible lesions. First, ask if he has any pain anywhere. Yeah, just right here. A little pain on the upper right side. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and start on the opposite side, on the lower left. So, okay. Go to the right. Okay, we could verbalize that there were normal active bowel sounds. He had pain on the upper right. We'll start on the lower left. Okay, and we could comment again that there were uh, normal resonance to percussion. Now we're going to go ahead and palpate. So the tip for this is for superficial first. We're just going to use one hand, and we're going to start on the lower left. 
and you want to make good eye contact to see if he winces at all and, or let him know if you have any pain to please let me know. We'll do it in the three quadrants on the bottom, three middle quadrants, and then three upper quadrants. Okay, and then we could have good confirmation that he was in pain enough. For deep, we just want to place our second hand on top and do, do it again. So we could Ouch. get a little pain in there on deep. We want to go ahead and check uh, for hepatomegaly. So the best way to do this is to place your hand under the border of his liver. You want to instruct the patient to please breathe in. And then as he breathes out, you can rebreathe out now. You want to go all the way up into the lower rib cage. And as long as you don't feel the liver coming, extending below, you can verbalize that there was no hepatomegaly. And you can do the same thing for the spleen. So again, please breathe in. And now please breathe out. Okay, and you can feel the lower left rib and there was no spleen coming down. So we want to go into the special test for the abdominal exam. If we were concerned about a gallbladder or cholecystitis, we would do a Murphy sign. So the instructions you want to give are opposite to the uh, hepatomegaly or splenomegaly. You want to first ask them now to breathe all the way out. Breathe all the way out. And you want to place your right hand on the right upper quadrant and now ask them to pre please breathe in. Oh. Okay, and then they'll verbalize that they had pain as the gallbladder came closer into contact with your hand. And now that concludes the abdominal exam, so you could help cover them again, and then sit them up, could it help sit you up? Okay, and then you just want to ask them if they have any questions for you. Yeah, that's